Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sunday Open Studio. We have a special guest today, Corey Hardiman, who is a local artist and prolific painter. Welcome, Corey, to the program. Thank you. I'm glad to have you here. Now, you have an exhibition in the Galleria right now that runs until the end of November. I that is correct. Yeah, and it's been traveling in the northern half of the province. It's been all over the place. I only finally got to see it for the first time uh, last week. Or you hadn't seen it put together before. I hadn't seen it. No, I hadn't seen it anywhere. Uh -huh. um, yeah. No, I, I, you know, openings are canceled and life is busy and yeah. Anyway, it looks great. I was really happy to see it up. Oh yeah, I walked through it the other day and it is fabulous. So if people have a chance, get down there before the end of November and see it. And if they miss it, they can also see it online in a digital format, can they not? Yeah, they certainly can. And I sure like that that digital exhibition. They did a great job. Yeah, yeah, that all looked very, very good. You also are doing something very special this month and a little bit different. You have a month of paintings and you are painting nests. All nests, all the time. All nests, every day. Why nests? Yeah. They're my favorite thing to paint. I have... Um, I probably have 70 or 80 nests. I have a collection of nests that I started years and years ago. Um, and I think, uh, I, I said this in my, in my demo, but I'll say it again. I never ever take nests out of trees or sheds or anywhere where they're built, but people are really generous to me and they know that I like to paint nests. And so they send them to me from all over the place. I have nests from across Canada, down in the States, um, one from overseas, uh, which is really lovely. They're, I just find them fascinating and I have since I was a kid and I think every kid finds nests fascinating. They're just such beautiful little artifacts and they're all so different from one another and they're, um, they're fragile, but they're really strong. You know, they come down in these windstorms sometimes and, and they hold their form. They're, they're just such wonderful little feats of architecture. I love them. Oh yeah. They're beautiful, aren't they? Especially when they start to weave the birds start to weave in threads and man-made objects. Yeah, I love that. I love how endlessly resourceful they are and how able they are to to take whatever's in their environment and use it in service of making the, the, these structures that are just there for them to rear their young. <laughs> yeah, and the horsehair nests and the I have nests with like the linings of somebody's mittens and I have one with a ribbon that is like probably like a seven foot long piece of white ribbon that's just woven through it. They're just so beautiful. I can never get enough of them. I'm always amazed by them. Well, I'm super excited about the demo that you're going to give us. I watched it, did a sneak preview the other day and it is fabulous. Oh, good. I'm really glad. In that demo, you're painting with oil paint, which will delight all the oil painters in town, I'm sure. Yes. For people who don't have oil paints at home, could they use a different paint, perhaps, or something else? They can use anything, really. I mean, the same the same kind of rules apply. The only difference, really, is that um, in my demo, I'm painting in an indirect way, so using layers of oil paint. That method doesn't work so well with other things. As far as the general principles of, of making the form, seeing the large objects first and then filling in the details later, that works across all media from drawing right up through, through oil painting. Yeah, I'm super excited. We'll get started in just a minute. Where else can people see your artwork, Corey, if they want to see it? Well, if they want to have a studio tour during COVID times and they're prepared to come and be uh, socially distant and wear masks, they can give me a buzz on my Facebook or my email or uh, my Facebook is actually probably the most reliable way to get a hold of me because that seems to be where I spend my time. Um, but my studio is downtown uh, Prince George on 3rd Avenue where the old uh, Final Chapter bookstore used to be. And I do have, you know, one at a time kind of studio visits from time to of time. Um, you can also find me online, as mentioned, mostly on Facebook, also Instagram. Um, and uh, yeah, I have a couple of shows a year at various places. So yeah, I'm around. Great. That's super. In the meantime, let's watch that demo. Thanks so much, Corey, for joining us. Thank you, Anna Maria. We'll see you again some other time, everybody. Have fun with the demo and paint some nests. Paint some nests. Uh, I'm Corey Hardiman. I'm going to uh, do one of my favorite things for you today. I'm going to paint a nest and I'm going to use a uh, an indirect method of oil painting. I'm only just going to use a couple of colors here. I, I have some transparent red oxide oil paint. You can use whatever you like. Um, 
I'm going to create a, an imprimatura or an underpainting and then I'm going to show you how to do a, another layer of velatura or a grisaille, sometimes people call it. Uh, this is a method of oil painting that the old masters used a lot. Uh, it's the kind of uh, it's the kind of technique that gives you the sort of glowing effect that people associate with oil painting because of the way the pigment is suspended in the oil uh, and when multiple layers of paint are applied over top of one another, the light can shine through those layers and, and create this optical effect of, of something that's really glowing and alive looking. Additionally, I'm painting on uh, copper panels. This isn't my usual, um, my usual surface because it's formidably expensive, but uh, they're beautiful to paint on. And I've prepared this panel uh, very simply <laughs> barely prepared it really. I sanded it lightly to give it a little bit of tooth so the paint would stick better. I put one uh, thin layer of oil painting, oil primer on the on the panel and I'm just going to paint on top of that. You can paint directly on copper. More commonly I paint on wood panels or canvas or linen. Um, sometimes I use gesso but oil primer is, is really nice to use. It doesn't soak up as much pigment as the gesso does. Um, so. I'm in the middle of doing a project of uh, painting a uh, nest every day for a month. So this, uh, this suits my purposes rather well. Over here I have a light box that I've made. It's a very simple structure. It's just a cardboard box uh, with a hole cut mm -hmm. in the top and a $12 lamp from the hardware store situated on top of that. I can move it around a bit to um, affect where shadows fall, where the light source is. I can put a dimmer switch on it. Um, there's I, I, whenever I'm painting from life, if I'm painting small objects, I just chuck them into that box and uh, move them around until I'm happy with them. So uh, I'm going to, I think I'll do the nest that I have sitting on the far left here. And in the imprimatura, um, I'm just going to pick up some uh, iron oxide on my old fuzzy brush. I can actually use a bigger brush than this, but this is what I have at hand. And, uh, and I'm really just going to knock in the areas of dark. So this part of making a painting is really just about massing pigment in the dark areas. And I can see that because of the way that nest is shaped, it is kind of generally an oval that is the opening of the nest. The light is falling sort of here. Sometimes I draw arrows on my paintings if I'm not looking directly at the object to remind myself of where the light source is. That is where all your depth comes from, it's from knowing where your lights are. And I'm just going to, there's a shadow that falls this way, along with this nest. And I'm just going to keep pushing those shadows in. And by the time I'm finished here, I'm not going to have any details. Detail at this stage is the enemy of everything. Um, we don't see like cameras. We are convinced that we, on an object like a nest, which is fairly uh, complicated, that we see every single detail all at once, but that is not how humans work. Um, as things move away from our eye, they become less detailed and our brains just fill in the rest. Uh, so you want to figure out as you go which areas of the painting you want to focus on in terms of detail. I can see that there's grass, some grasses sticking out here, there's some up here, but I'm not really even going to worry about that right now. I'm going to grab um, a little bit of odorless solvent and I'm going to start moving this paint around a little bit. So again, this is just one kind of paint applied fairly thinly and over the whole surface of this panel. I'm just wiping it out. And this way, it will dry quite quickly, so in another day or two, I'll be able to move on to the Velatura, uh, which is the next layer. These paintings can have as many layers as you want, it's sort of a minimum of three usually, um, but as many as, as you're comfortable with. And we're going to remember to adhere to the rule in oil painting of applying paint uh, fat over lean. And that just means that the areas, uh, the, the, the layer of paint that has more oil is applied on top of the areas that have less oil. So for that reason, on this initial layer, 
I'm just using odorless mineral solvent. Uh, the next layer, I will use probably no oil or a tiny bit of linseed oil um, to thin my paint. And uh, the preceding layers from that, I'll use progressively more oil. But you don't want to get too carried away with the oil. It really slows down your drying time. And the more you fiddle around with the chemical composition of your paintings, the more likely it is that they will crack or do other unfortunate things. That's uh, not such a risk with this surface because, of course, um, it's not flexible at all and uh, not not prone to some of the some of the things that canvas and so on can can be prone to. So I'm actually fine with this looking just the way it does. It's not, it's not detailed at all. I don't want any real hard lines at this stage. Um, that is all going to come later. Just want to be able to look at it and remind myself of where the light is when I come back to it in a day or two. So there is an imprimatura of a nest. Now I'll grab one that I started a couple of days ago. It should be dry now. Oh, maybe it isn't. It's dry-ish. It's dry enough probably for my purposes, but you should really make sure that your paintings are completely dry before you move on to the next layer. Otherwise, you'll just pick up pigment from underneath and make a big mess. When we talk about paintings getting muddy, that's often what is happening. It's that we're mixing uh, paint into colors that we don't want to mix it into. But I'm not using this method, you know, I'll paint directly. And I will at the, probably at the end of this painting anyway, I'll, I'll move into a more direct kind of painting rather than just applying one color at a time. Now, Velatera means veil. And it's just, um, this is the part of the painting where you start masking the lights. So in the Imprimatura, we mask the darks. In the Bellatura, we mask the lights. And I'm using now the nest that's on the far right over here. And I can see that the light is shining to the left side over here. I'm actually going to lighten up this background too a bit. You can see it's, um, it's quite interesting with this palette that you get these kind of optical grays um, between a, a, the, the red. Yeah, I am picking up a little bit of paint here. That's all right. It's not the end of the world. For a demo, it's not a problem. But it's really important to let your, let your layers dry completely. If you're painting really thinly, as I am, that really shouldn't take more than a, a day or two. It's fairly snowy out, so I guess maybe the uh, atmosphere has affected my drying time a little bit. But I'm going to knock uh, light into every part of this painting, including in the shadows. And one of the things that we tend to think that we're wrong about, there's so much that we're wrong about, is that um, we tend to think that we see detail in the lightest areas, but that's actually not how it works. We tend to actually see the most detail in areas of shadow. Light tends to diffuse the effect of details. And so while I'm still being quite um, vague here, I'm, I'm going to start pushing in a few of these strands of grass that are coming across. I just want to start getting some structure in here. And again, I'm not going to I'm not going to get too carried away. I'm using quite a, uh, I'm using a, what size is this, like an eight? Oh no, it's not, it's a five. A number five this is a natural bristle brush, so it's a uh, hog bristle. And these brushes, especially as they get older, they're nice. They hold quite a lot of paint because the bristles break and bend. And so they tend to become more useful actually as they age. I like my old brushes, a nice soft effect. And again, I don't want to be too hard edged about anything at this stage. I'm really just pushing in areas of light.
So I'm not using, I'm hardly using any paint at all, and I'm using titanium white um, because that is probably the paint I use the most. Uh, if you use lead white, that is a more transparent white than titanium white, but this is just fine. And I, I'm really just, I'm using a minute amount, so I'm just taking a tiny bit, laying it down, and then patting it, spreading it out, really getting a feel for my surface. And that's one of the lovely things about oil painting, particularly, is that the texture of the paint, the feel of the surface, the, the kind of dance between pigment and ground is so lovely. I can never, I know there are a lot of people that think acrylics are, I don't know, easier or tidier or something, and they, I guess they're easier to clean up, but I don't, I don't like the way they feel. They just are so plasticky. And I love everything about oil paint. I love how it smells. I love the texture. And I particularly love using it for nests. Now, if you don't have a nest at hand, first of all, I would strongly discourage you from going out and taking a nest out of a tree or a shed or wherever. Birds do return to their nests year after year. And even if they don't, other animals will recycle, upcycle, live in those structures. But um, I'm very fortunate, sorry, my dog is doing something daft. I'm very fortunate in that people send me nests from all over the place. And again, they're not, um, they're nests that come down when trees fall or windfall nests or um, nests that are in doomed structures or whatever. I, I really discourage people to take them uh, from removing them from their, their habitat. I'm just going to, Harriet, I'm going to squint and step back a little bit here for a minute and have a look at that nest, have a look at this. This is the best way to see, you can stop that. The best way to see what you're doing in many ways is to just squint your eyes constantly. It'll show you what's important. You don't want to be seeing all those details. It's how we get lost in our paintings. We get carried away. It's like when we're drawing a human face and we start with the eyes. You need to start with the shadows. You need to start with the big areas of light and dark. The details will start to suggest themselves in time. Our brains are very, very good at filling in details, and if you have to like spoon feed every detail of the structure, it loses the realism. We, we don't see that way. We really don't. We are not cameras. We don't. We don't look at a thing and see everything at once. Our eyes travel across the surface, and uh, the beauty of painting is that you can play with how how your eyes move. It's it's just a wonderful dance my most favorite thing. Okay, so this is getting close to where I want it to be. I will grab yet another piece that I started a few days ago. This one is, I don't know, this is not really in any, this is often how I, how I leave my paintings in progress. So it's kind of messy. Um, it's not a complete uh, velatura. It's sort of a partial velatura. It's not even really dry, but I'm going to break all my own rules and work on it anyway. So this is a part, the part that I find really quite fun. And this is really just where you start painting. So um, again, I'm using a limited palette. I've got some yellow ochre, um, some cold black, and oh, a tiny little brush. This is probably too small for what I really want to do here. A bunch of tiny little brushes here, apparently. Oh, this one's a little bigger. This is a number four Princeton. These are nice. This is a synthetic brush that doesn't hold paint quite the way that uh, the, um, the natural bristle brushes do, but it has a lovely softness. It's, I think it's synthetic, uh, not mink, but something like that, some sort of weasel. Um, and I'm going to really start darkening my, my shadows. Keeping in mind, so this is the middle nest here in my, in my box. Keeping in mind that every little sticky outy part of this nest casts its own shadow. And those are the parts that I'm interested in. The sticky outy parts will start suggesting themselves as those shadows come in. So I'm, I'm just using a little cold black, a little uh, burnt sienna, and a little bit of that um, transparent red oxide. And I'm going to start noticing a few of the strands of grass. So I don't want every strand. We don't want to have these, these super attenuated uh, things. 
but I am going to put a few of them in because that's what we see. We see the detail with our brains more than we do with our eyes. So a little bit of white, a little yellow ochre, noticing the variations in color in the object itself. Um, you can work from a photograph. There's no reason not to. But often, if I work from a photograph, I will also take some plasticine and build a little model so that I can shine a light on it so I can remind myself um, both to avoid the detail, because I do love getting finicky with a little brush, and also to uh, just show me how, how things work, because again, cameras don't see like we do. They see everything all at once, and we do not. Much though we think we're sort of omniscient, we are not. So you can see I'm just starting to pick up Again, reminding myself this light is basically straight overhead. There's some little bits and pieces in here. Some parts of the light is really shining on. Some areas that I can push around and some areas that I want to show that there's all of this dangly stuff. I think that this is a Pacific um, Pacific slope fly catcher nest. I could be wrong. It's hard with birds to identify the species by the nest because they're so, they're so different from one another. Every nest is so completely different from every other and they depend so much on what materials are available to the builders, um, what the environment is, what they're built in, whether they're in a tree or on a, in a roof or wherever. Um, so unless there's an egg or some other identifying thing, feathers or whatever, it's often hard to say, all these little songbird nests tend to be quite similar, but the Pacific slow, Slope uh, flycatchers often have these long sort of tails on their nests, and that is kind of an identifying feature. So I'm, I'm guessing that's what this is. It's got all this sort of extra material hanging down. Speaking of which, I have dog hair on my paintbrush. It's one of the leaves in here. I want to say it's so nice to have my daughter in shooting this for me. I tried to I tried to do it by myself yesterday, and I failed. Boy, I just stood in front of the uh, screen with my back to it the whole time, <laughs> made sure that no one could see what I was doing. So <laughs> this is much much better. There's some sort of little piece of paper in this nest. I really love um, I really love the way birds use materials. They just, they just find what they need in every environment. I have nests that have bits of wool in them. I have nests that have bits of somebody's sweater or mitten. Um, I have a nest, I think it's still in Vancouver, that someone gave me that has a long ribbon woven all through it. Um, they're just so, birds are so endlessly creative and clever and knowledgeable. So I think I'm fairly pleased with the shape this is taking. I'm going to start knocking in some more shadows again. And this is just, you know, once you get to this stage, you just sort of hit that rhythm where you see what you, see what you need as you go. It's really important to step back periodically, rest your eyes, squint, remind yourself what's important. Um, don't get too carried away with those details. It does get fun, but it's not, it's not what you're here to do building something and that thing has to have depth and uh, contrast is what makes depth. So your lights and your shadows and then you can worry about your mid-tones and all that other stuff. Harriet, stop working at everyone. This is the thing about having a studio downtown. I have a barber shop next door and so there's always people outside looking in and the dog feels she needs to defend me from all of them. Harriet, that's enough. I picked up a little bit of bohemian earth green. These are just weird colors that I somehow have in my palette that I like to try and find uses for. I, uh, you know, pre-pandemic when I, whenever I'd feel like I had too much money burning a hole in my pocket, I'd just buy some weird tube of paint that I hadn't bought before. 
I really like this color actually. Anyway, so I'm just going to keep going along like this. I'll probably do that for the rest of the day. This seems like as good a place as any to stop. Um, if you want to see some of my finished nests, you can just go to my Facebook page. It's Corey Hardeman Painter on Facebook. I'm posting one a day, probably this one today, actually. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you to my lovely daughter for filming. Thank you to Anne Maria for everything. And Two Rivers Gallery, and uh, I hope you guys have fun painting things. Thank you.